Вітаємо, шановні учасники! Раді бачити вас на продовженні серії вебінарів «Україна ЄС про спінальні дезрафізми». Серія вебінарів організована ІРН Євроджен, Міжнародним благодійним фондом «Умні мережа для дітей» та Міжнародною федерацією спінобіфіда та гідроцефалії. Сьогодні ми маємо приємність зустрітися уже в шосте. І ви мали можливість подивитися основні тим, хто до нас приєднався вперше. Ви мали можливість ознайомитися з основними правилами нашої роботи на цій серії вебінарів. Отже, хочу нагадати, що питання ви зможете задати в чаті, імейлом і на сайті. Традиційно звернення до українських учасників. У разі, якщо звучатиме сигнал повітряної тривоги, ми змушені припинити наш вебінар і всі учасники з України повинні спуститися у сховище. Запис буде доступний на сторінці ІРН, ІРН Євроджен. Також хочу нагадати, що за нашою традицією ми починаємо черговий вебінар з відповіді на питання попереднього вебінару. Тому я зараз з приємністю передаю слово професору Мусієло для відповідей і для вступного слова. Професор Мусієло, the floor is yours. Dear all, welcome again to this new webinar of our series on urological management of spina bifida. Giovanni Mosiello is speaking. Welcome again. Today we will have a webinar on urinary tract infection and vesicourethral management. We will have to us with us two fantastic speakers, Professor Raymond Stein and Professor Giovanni Montini. Professor Raymond Stein is a pediatric urologist in the University of Mannheim. His main areas of clinical expertise include neurogenic bladder, hypospadias, bladder extrophy, upper urinary tract dilatation, urinary diversion, reconstructive surgery, and of course, vesico-urethral reflux management. Professor Giovanni Montini is full professor of pediatrics in the University of Milan and director of pediatric unit of nephrology and dialysis and transplantation in Policlinico Maggiore in Milan. His main areas of clinical expertise include urinary tract infection, pediatric renal transplantation, chronic and acute renal failure, caput nephrotis syndrome, and renal involvement in mitochondrial disease. Both of them are well known for their clinical expertise and for their editorial activities. And I believe that their presentation will be very, very useful and interesting. For your question, please remember that if you wish to ask a question regarding the presentation, you can do so by typing into the question box during the presentation. Some of the questions will be addressed in the webinar. You can also submit questions after the webinar, as usual, and this will be answered at the beginning of the next session. They will also publish on the Earn Eurogen website. Regarding questions, now we will go to see the question that we have received for the previous webinar on Eurodynamics on the presentation of Professor Rein Nyman. We received several questions and we will go to evaluate. The first question was related to what to do for urodynamic studies in patients with autism. In patients with autism, it's very difficult to perform invasive evaluation with a transutral catheter. So the suggestion is to use no invasive urodynamic as you can do with the bladder ultrasound, surface electromyography, flowmetry, post voiding residual. For invasive urodynamics in selected cases, consider to use a suprapubic success, introducing the cystofix the day before in sedation. Second question was about the contraindication of urodynamic in children and which is the lower age for performing urodynamic. 
a contraindication are UTI. Never perform urodynamics with acute UTI. Regarding age, you could perform in the first day of life too. It depends about the goal and must consider the risk of act artifacts. In newborns with spina bifida aperta, the first urodynamics should be performed after the phase of spinal shock. That normally is a for means after the second or third months of life. Especially in newborns, performing interpretation urodynamics could be difficult, as bladder function may have some immature signs as the tubes of sphincter discoordination, high volume pressure, a very low bladder capacity. Other question was about the bladder filling phase in the urodynamic examination. When to stop the filling if we observe the appearance of urinary bilateral reflux and when vesicolateral reflux increases at the beginning just after the, the vesicolateral appears. Other question was about the role of evaluation of the pressure, the vesicle pressure or the trusal pressure. First of all, you must consider always the trusal pressure. That is vesical pressure less the abdominal pressure. Second, regarding when to stop the filling, sometimes there is a transient minimal reflux during filling for increasing the trusal pressure, especially if we have overactivity of the detrusor. So it's useful to record when view appears, but it's better to stop filling when will increase and is continuous. How do you evaluate sphincter competence? Say, measuring leak point pressure. Other question, is it mandatory to measure urethral pressure profile in children and why? No, it's not so significant as in adults and that there is a high risk of artifacts. For this reason, urethral pressure measurement is indicated in very, very selected cases in adolescents only. In which impairment, in addition to neurogenic bladder, is a real dynamic examination indicated? In many situations, in bladder estrophy epispadias complex, in epispadias, in posterior retral valves, in severe reflux, better of course a video dynamic, before any major surgery for continence. Other question is related to the preparation of children for urodynamics and timing for premedication. Before any urodynamic, a urinary analysis should be undertaken. The first assessment should be done under antibiotic prophylaxis. A cochrane analysis showed that administration of prophylaxis antibiotics compared to placebo reduced the risk of significant bacteriuria. However, this was without a significant difference for symptomatic UTI, fever or discomfort. If there is a significant bacteriuria, antibacterial treatment should be discussed, especially in older patients, as a single dose may be sufficient as intravesical gentamicin. Other point is bowel management. Bowel management has a positive effect on bladder function and the urodynamic findings. Better rectal pressure measurement. Other point is premedication. In some center, there is the use of midazolam that could be useful in some case. Anyway, remember that you must record the emptying phase and then you need to have your patients away. Last two questions regarding the normative value of pressure during systometry and the age of the patients and the device. You must consider that the correct capacity for age, as we have seen during the presentation, in order to define correct filling rate, understand when you can stop the filling if maturation does not occur. Furthermore, you have seen that uh, there is a high risk value in end filling pressure or leak point pressure above 40 cm of water. But in pediatric, only value below 25 are safe. Value between 
25 and 40 cm are low risk area. And of course, remember that over 40 cm water you are always in a high risk situation. No difference is related to aerodynamic equipment. Anyway, comparing results, pay attention to use always the same kind of transducer, water or air transducer. Last question was related to urophlometry. Urophlometry normally is informative after three years of age, after the daily pad removal, and of course perform urophlometry according to ICCS recommendation. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope really that you could enjoy the, this presentation of today. Thanks. Uh, Professor Musiella, thank you very much for giving details answers for, to the questions. And now we start with our today today's presentations. Uh, and now we gladly give floor to our esteemed speakers, Professor Giovanni Montini and Professor Raymond Stein. Welcome. Good afternoon to everybody, and thank you very much to the organizing committee for this very kind invitation to be part of this webinar series on spinal dysraphisms. Today we speak mainly of urinary tract infections in children with a neurogenic bladder, as I'm a pediatric nephrologist. As you well know, in normal situations, the urinary tract is germ-free. And the main defense from bacteria invasion is the adequate urine flow from up to down and the intact uroepithelium. And this explains also why uh, the most common bacteria which produces uh, UTIs in children is uh, E. coli, because E. coli has got the fimbria which uh, facilitate uh, the attachment to the urepithelium and uh, allows for, to the bacteria to go up to, to, to the kidneys. And uh, I call this bacteria the, the spider bacteria of the urinary tract. When uh, bacteria enter, a number of conditions may develop. We can have a febrile UTI uh, which produces an activation of the inflammatory process, and it is commonly called the pyelonephritis. We can have bacteriuria, and we can have, we have a cystitis. And uh, here you can see the bacteria, in this case, an E. coli with the fimbria, which arrives to the kidney. Uh, when it arrives to the kidney, it attaches to the TLR4 receptor, stimulating the innate immune process with the production of an FK beta, which goes to the nucleus and activate the nucleus in the production of cytokines and chemokines, which uh, uh, produce the inflammation at the local level and at the systemic level, for example, with the production of interleukin-6, which uh, is responsible of fever, with the production of interleukin-8 and TNF-alpha, which increases the uh, arrival of uh, uh, of uh, uh, leukocytes at the local level and produce the local inflammation process. In most cases, this inflammation process is completely clear, also because of the use of antibiotics, but in some cases, there can be the production of scars. And this is what is a major worry when we have pyelonephritis in kidneys, because if you have a lot of scarring, you can have a, 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 a a, a, a process which uh, in some way reduces the function of the kidney. And this is what you see at the DMSA scan uh, and what are the scars, which are actually a, of this scan quite rare in children. Most of the children have a complete clearance of the infection. And what is most common, we can have a normal kidneys or we can have dysplastic kidneys, which are congenital, uh, and, and, and which are congenital. 
Uh, the other process is cystitis, which does not produce an activation of the inflammatory process, uh, and we do not have fevers. And so this is a most important distinction between uh, febrile and non-febrile infections. And we can have, as far as uh, children with neurogenic blood are concerned, UTIs are quite, quite common. UTIs are the most common infection, actually. And uh, for example, in 31%, uh, the diagnosis of neurogenic blood there occurred because of, a episode, of an episode of UTI within the first year of life. And 21% of these children were hospitalized. UTI is still uh, the most common complaint in the emergency room setting for this population. And they have an average of 2.5 symptomatic UTIs per year. And uh, uh, in this population, there is a higher risk of morbidity and mortality secondary to urosepsis and then stage kidney disease relative to the general population. But why these children have such a high uh, percentage of uh, UTIs? There are a number of reasons which are well summarized in this graphic. But I would like to draw your attention to some main points. Uh, one is that these children, they do perform uh, intermittent catheterization, and this is a high risk factor. Second is that there is a, a special bacterial colonization in the perineum and in the urethra. Uh, there are some hydrokinetic factors that are related mainly to the inefficient voiding and the uh, presence of uh, high volumes of uh, post uh, voiding uh, urine. Uh, this produces bladder ischemia uh, and a reduction of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the capacity to defend to the infections at the local level. And uh, uh, there is a, a, a compromise wash, wash out of bacteria and uh, everything at the end uh, increases the risk of UTIs in this population. This is a, a recent study which evaluated risk factors for recurrent urinary tract infections in children with neurogenic blood and intermittent catheterization. It's a, a population a study cohort of 327 children between 9 and 150 months of age. And the population was divided in children with recurrent UTIs, more than one UTI per, per year. And uh, there were 79 children, 24% uh, of the population, and children with less than one UTI per year, 76%. At the end of the follow-up, CKD was present in 39% of the children with recurrent UTIs and 12% of the children with just an episodic uh, uh, UTI. And uh, the univariate and multivariate analysis of the various risk factors showed that uh, risk factors were older age, long duration of neurogenic blood, uh, the occurrence and the presence of basic urethral reflux, uh, an increased uh, bladder wall thickness, uh, the presence of a low bladder compliance, uh, and the presence of a high level of spinal cord lesions. And the authors concluded that no continuous antibiotic prophylaxis is necessary in this population. It's necessary a close follow-up of these children and clinical and urodynamic examinations. Uh, there are a number of uh, guidelines published for UTIs, but no one applies uh, uh, to children with neurogenic blood. There are some studies, but there are no evidence-based medicine uh, uh, guidelines. So what I will tell to you is mainly experience and data coming from various studies published. The diagnosis is difficult. A key factor complicating the study and treatment of UTI is the lack of consensus definition of infection because of a number of factors, mainly because there is an impersonation with no specific infectious symptoms, and there is a, an ubiquitous bacterial colonization of the bladder in this population. Uh, for the diagnosis, very useful is the use of uh, uh, deep stick analysis and uh, 
urine analysis, but the deep six itself uh, can actually predict in a very good way the uh, uh, the occurrence of UTI. If we have a deep stick which is negative for nitrite and leukocytes, uh, the probability to have a UTI is very, very low. And uh, how do we define UTI in this population? Uh, in this population, we will have mainly the uh, possibility to perform urine culture through transurethral bladder catheter because of the intermittent catheterization. And uh, there are various definitions of the threshold of bacteria that you need to have to define a UTI in this population. And our Italian guidelines define the, 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 the presence of an infection as more than 10 to the fourth uh, coloniforming unit per milliliters. <clears throat> and uh, in patients uh, with uh, neurogenic bladder, the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research uh, defined uh, uh, UTI as the presence of more than 10 to the second coloniforming unit from intermittent catheterization. I believe that this is a quite low threshold and I would prefer to keep on the uh, threshold of 10 to the fourth. Uh, other points are, as we told, that the, the typical symptoms, uh, dysuria, urgency, frequency, are rarely present. And common symptoms are autonomic dysreflexia, increased spasticity, new words in urine continence, uh, uh, a bag abdominal plate, and uh, smelling urine, which per se has a low sensitivity. And uh, uh, a, a flow chart for the diagnosis of UTI, uh, this is a very useful flow chart. What is necessary to perform is a urine analysis of deep stick. If it is negative, no further testing is necessary. If urine culture is negative, no infection there will be. And uh, if the urine culture is positive with the symptoms, uh, we can uh, proceed to the diagnosis. But if there are no symptoms, uh, we define it as asymptomatic bacteriuria, as no treatment is necessary. How do we treat this population? We treat this population with antibiotic, uh, but we have to keep in mind that pathogens uh, and sensitivities differ from the general population. In, in, in the uh, uh, neurogenic bladder children, E. coli is much more uncommon than in the children with a normal urinary tract. So when we decide an antibiotic, we have to choose a large spectrum antibiotic. In most instances, we can use uh, uh, oral antibiotics uh, and what about the duration? Uh, there are some studies which uh, actually require in this population a longer duration of what we use in normal children. So at least 14 days of antibiotic treatment in symptomatic infections is uh, recommended. How do we monitor this population? There is no demonstrable utility in routine screening with urine analysis or urine culture. And antibiotic prophylaxis has limited efficacy and is associated actually with an increased antibiotic resistance. And I show you very briefly a very recent study that we published uh, uh, last year on the use of antibiotic prophylaxis in infants with high grade vesicular ureteral reflux. This is a, a very specific, special population uh, show very uh, tiny infants and they were randomized at the median age of two months uh, with no previous infections. And what we showed is that there was a, a small, significant, but small difference between the untreated group and the prophylaxis group, leaving a very large population for two years with no infections, even if they were not treated. And uh, what came out from this study is that uh, uh, resistance uh, was much more increased to in the prophylaxis group uh, versus the untreated group. So our conclusion from this study is that we found a small but significant benefit of continuous antibiotic prophylaxis 
in preventing the first UTI in young infants with high-grade reflux. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we uh, concluded that our results do not support the routine use of uh, prophylaxis because 64% of the non-treatment group did not have a UTI. The number needed to treat uh, to prevent one febrile UTI was large, it was necessary to treat seven children for two years, so a total of 14 years of prophylaxis. No differences as far as the scars occurrence and uh, uh, variations of G EGFR in this population. ETI were easily treated in both groups uh, and because of the emergence of uh, resistant strains. So what more about monitoring and prevention? The routine use of Cambry is not recommended. There is a Cochrane evaluation mainly done, uh, done on adults. Uh, uh, but uh, this Cochrane uh, does not recommend the use of, uh, uh, of, of cranberry, and there are very few studies in the pediatric population. What about the use of probiotics, uh, vaccines, uh, bladder inoculation of uh, uh, viral and strains, uh, bladder irrigation? Well, even in this case, there are no uh, uh, evidence-based studies but it could be recommended in some children, especially those who have a high number of recurrences of pyelonephritis. And thank you very much for your attention. Good evening, spina bifida and reflux. I have no conflict of interest. If you think about spina bifida and reflux, we have to distinguish between primary and secondary reflux, but it's very difficult to discriminate between them. Most of the refluxes are secondary nature. Our goal is reflux are prevention of infections, preservation of renal function, and sure, avoiding new renal scars. For diagnostics, we have the video dynamics shown by Reen last time. If you don't have video dynamics, you can do a VCOG and urodynamics and get almost the same results. To look for split renal function or scars, DMSA scan is still the gold standard today. The MRI may follow in the future. With a TMSA scan, we see in adults up to almost half of the patient have renal scars. And the renal scars correlates very well with hypertension later on. So should we do a baseline evaluation in the first year of life? The Sweden groups are very in favor of doing DMSN scans or renographies quite early in patients with spina bifida and repeat it quite a lot of times. Almost 20 years ago, the group from Tom De Jong showed that early start of therapy means CIC and anticholinergics preserve kidney function in this population. And almost 10 years ago, in Germany, we agreed on an interdisciplinary guideline where we start very early with the diagnostic tools, means video dynamics, aerodynamics, and start also very early proactive management. But we are still a little bit reluctant to do renal scans and only if we have a dilatation of the upper tract or we have the suspicion of scars, we do a renal scan. The Americans start also now with proactive management. And you can see here that the reflux plays an important role, how to treat the patients during the follow-up. 
the EAU and the SPO guideline committee, we agreed also to do start very early with management doing CIC and maybe anticholinergics, doing a with UG, doing video dynamics, and if there's reflux, we treat them with antibiotic prophylaxis. And also we agreed to do a renal scan within the first six months of life as a baseline. The Irish group showed that following the EAU ESPU guideline and doing a very early DMSA scan, you see only normal, most cases, normal kidneys. And those who have some scars are only those who have a high grade reflux or where status post <clears throat> postpile nephritis and having reflux of kidneys too. So the question still remains if we do only DMSA skin in selectors patients, or should we do it in all of them? What to do with a symptomatic primary reflex? Is it really primarily? We don't know most of the times. We can use sparking agents, as a lot of people are doing this today, or we can use a retail reimplantation. Using bulking agents, in the long term, you have a success rate of less than 25%, but you have the risk of obstruction due to the bartram agents. On the other hand, <clears throat> if you do a reimplantation using the cone, politano, lich or sausage technique, you have a success rate of more than 80%. But most of the refluxes we see are those due to the pathology of the platter, means the overactive platter and the overactive sphincter. And just recently, the Toronto group demonstrated in a meta-analysis that if you really start with proactive treatment, reflux is less common than we do expectant management. So using augmentation, you increase the bladder capacity, you decrease the bladder pressure. And this started already more than uh, 125 years ago with ileal segments. And you can use gastric, cecum, colon, or the ureter too. Still in 2024, tissue engineering or using artificial material like SAS is experimental. This is a little bit disappointing. When I started my career, <clears throat> I always thought that tissue engineering will come up with some solutions. When you do bladder augmentation, you have to open the bladder wide. You can use ileal or colonic segments, but you have to deal with a revision rate of at least 36%. If you are lucky, if the patient is unlucky, and you have a severe dilated ureter with a non-functioning kidney, you can use a cystoplasty. And this is the only patient where it really works in my hands. And you have a augment reaugmentation rate, as Adak Hussman showed, is up to 80%. So it depends really on patient selection. Doing a partial detrusorectomy or detrusomyotomy, a meta-analysis recently presented at the ESPU meeting showed that you can reduce or make a better compliance, have a better compliance in 50% uh, and you get a capacity, a higher capacity in 65%. So, and also, especially those who have a bigger bladder capacity and more than 50% of the age-related bladder capacity may benefit of this. So when it comes to augmentation, on the other hand, the group 
and Toronto again showed that if you have a low grade reflux, you have a quite high resolution rate. But if you have a high grade reflux, your deep resolution rate still goes down. So in these patients, we would recommend to do a ritual reimplantation. So in the long run, in patient with spina bifida, we have a lifelong commitment to have to treat and observe these patients and deal with them. And our goal as pediatric urologists, urologists, pediatric surgeons, or pediatricians is prevention of complication. They start usually with a normal kidney function, and they should keep this for a very long time, at least at the end of their life. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor Stein and Professor Montini for sharing your experience and expertise. And now we go to questions and answers session and give word to Professor Musiello. Дякуємо нашим шановним прекрасним сьогоднішнім спікерам і переходимо до розділу відповіді питання відповіді. Передаю з приємністю слово професору Мусіело. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. My compliments to the speakers. Very clear and very useful. And I believe that we are very lucky to have this opportunity to have a face-to-face -face between a nephrologist and urologist. And we have also two urologists because we have also the advantage to have with us Professor Rin Nyman. So we received some questions before and some questions we received during the presentation. I believe that is correct that we start with the first question that we received by mail before. And so uh, please choose what you would like to answer uh, about the question. I believe that maybe the first one are more related to a nephrological part about the role of bacteriophages and phagenes in the treatment prevention of urinary tract infection. What do you think, Professor Montini? Thank you very much, Giovanni. That's a very interesting, a very up-to-date question, but uh, practically we do not have nothing. We have some studies. Uh, there is a, a, a vaccine against uh, some uh, uropathogenic uh, uh, E. coli, uh, which is being developed <coughs> and uh, is now uh, uh, is going. Uh, um, there is a study phase three study on adults and there are no studies in children. But E. coli is not the most common bacteria in these children. We have seen that 20% of infections are from E. coli, the rest are from other uh, bacteria. So uh, I hope that in the future we can, could have some of these uh, tools uh, to, uh, to use for uh, these children. And this is related in part also to question three, fighting against antibiotic resistant bacteria. I mean, that's a very difficult topic. We still, we now have some uh, uh, multi-drug resistant bacteria. And of course, we have to choose the right antibiotic uh, based on uh, uh, the data that come from uh, the laboratory, from the, uh, I mean, to see what these bacteria are sensible to. Uh, and uh, these are very difficult situations that are actually increasing, especially for these children who are often hospitalized and they can have uh, uh, multi-drug resistant bacteria causing infections to them. Thanks. And uh, for the second question about the blood installation for and against, if, yes, so exactly, maybe, I believe that is related to the use in some center about to use intravesical antibiotics as a Zenta machine. What do you, I believe that it could be useful to receive the opinion of all. Please, Giovanni, what is your opinion? My opinion is that you can actually use it in some situations. We have done it. Uh, it's not uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, routine way to use antibiotic for these children, but there are some situations, some difficult situations, where bladder installation is uh, 
uh, a, a good tool to uh, use against uh, uh, UTIs in these children. Okay, Professor Stein, please, your opinion? Yeah, I think too, like Professor Montini, I think uh, gentamicin, I think only it's gentamicin which you can use. It's also a question of the dosage, but you may use it and it's an option if you have very resistant things or you have a severe complication due to bowel uh, complication, then the gentamicin works more or less in the bladder. It's not very much, uh, they call it uh, reabsorbed from the bladder, so it works. But it's a very, very, very few selected patients where you may use it. Thank you very much. Professor Nyman, do you agree with the, yeah? Yeah, I agree with both of them. And I think it is extremely important to realize that the resistance against most antibiotics is induced by us as medical doctors. So I agree that we have to be extremely careful when you decide to give antibiotics to children in this condition, and only when you have no other possibilities, bladder installation, for instance, with gentamicin, could be a good option. Okay, and uh, for the fourth question, uh, there is an agreement between all about lecocituria with fever to treat or not. Giovanni, please. Uh, yes. Uh... Well, uh, leucocituria itself, uh, you, there's no need to treat leucocituria itself. I mean, if you have leucocituria with the symptoms, it's a very different situation. But what is more, more important is to perform a urine culture. So you have to use uh, urine dipstick and urine culture together. And of course, symptoms. Asymptomatic bacteriuria, we have already said there is no need to treat it. And uh, what is asymptomatic bacteriuria is uh, the presence of uh, 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 bacteria at the urine culture, also at a significant level, with no symptoms uh, and with uh, no leucocituria or with a very tiny quantity of uh, uh, white blood cells. Of course, if you have a huge quantity of white blood cells, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a different situation and uh, you have to evaluate case by case when to treat or not to treat, but generally it's not necessary to treat. That's my opinion. I don't know. Thank uh, you, Professor Stein. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't treat it. Uh, maybe do a urine culture, but even if the patients or the parents do it at home and they have some leukocytes in the dipsticks, I would recommend to do nothing at all because it's just could be from the catheterization, it could be that there are some asymptomatic bacteriuria, but uh, also to, to, to teach the parents to do every time and urine culture, I don't know how many urine cultures you will get from these patients, because I think when you do the dipsticks every day, you will have it in at least 20%, 30% every day, uh, leukocytoria, yeah, that's on the market side. So I usually tell the parents, don't do it, do it only when there are symptoms, then do it, and then do a culture. But if there are no symptoms, do nothing. Professor Nyman, do you agree, Rin? Absolutely, I'm in complete agreement. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have I a question would... about this. Do Giovanni, you? Can I, can I just, I, I agree. I mean, I pointed out very clearly that there is no reason to perform routine urine analysis and urine culture. No reason. I mean, only when you have symptoms. That's very important. Yeah. No. One uh, one question by me about this. And do you believe that we are really able to explain to general practitioner and to pediatrician how to manage uh, this situation? Because is I believe that is uh, quite common for every one of us. Uh, to have a patient that uh, represent to us the question, uh, my pediatrician or my general practitioner suggests to treat, and do you believe that maybe we have to work mainly with uh, our colleagues to explain uh, the difference between the 
to explain the, the, uh, the, the, what, what is a real UTI in a patient with a clean intermediate catheterization, or otherwise do you believe that uh, we have done all? Giovanni, what do you think with about a nephrologist world? And we have to work more or not? Well, we always have to work more, always. <laughs> yeah. And that, that, that's quite important. But uh, I, I, I don't know the, what happens in Ukraine, actually. But in Italy, we're trying to, 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 to make it very clear to most of pediatricians and GPs uh, our thoughts and what we think about this situation. So I don't know if I've got right your, your question, actually. but. Okay, some, content, some comments by Raimund or Rin? No. No. No? Okay. No. Okay, we have other questions and uh, uh, you can read and uh, about the percentage of patients experience regression or reduction in degree of vesicular reflux with a conservative treatment uh, with, uh, I believe, uh, uh, is uh, anticholinergic and intermittent catheterization. What is your experience? And what is your recommendation for that question? Do you have any comment? Well, I think that Raymond pointed it in his one of his slides <clears throat> that when when you change the characteristics of the bladder into a low pressure, high capacity reservoir, that a significant number of refluxes will disappear. And some of the high-grade refluxes diminish, they may persist. And um, if they are asymptomatic, they don't develop urinary tract infections with fever, I would be rather reluctant to do any kind of surgery in those patients. Mm -hmm. yep. Do you agree, Raymond? I think I hope that was what I pointed out in the... Uh, slides and in the presentation it's yeah. uh, most of them you don't need to treat and only if you have a high grade symptomatic reflex and you have a very low bladder capacity and a very uncompliant bladder then i think even in these patients only augmentation or increasing the resistance will help but if you have a, for example a moderate bladder capacity a high grade reflex and a moderate pressure and you do an augment, then maybe it's uh, useful to reimplant if you have really a high grade reflux because the symptomatic may not disappear when you do it. But it's so rare, I think I have done only one or two in my career. Okay, and I've seen that in your presentation, you presented the uh, low efficacy or long term of the mean invasive treatment with the bulking agents. Do you believe that uh, this uh, uh, low percentage of success could be increased with a combined approach with uh, uh, bulking agents as a deflux or other and, uh, uh, and the bottling toxin? I think it's only the uh, treatment of the bladder which makes the success of the bulking yeah. agent in the neurogenic bladder uh, okay. situation. Do you agree, Rin? Yes. This yeah. yeah. I totally agree. Okay, Giovanni, do you have any comments about that? No, no. And uh, what drugs are used as anti relapse therapy for urinary tract infection? I've seen in the presentation of uh, uh, Giovanni about the cranberry, and do you have any other comments? Well, uh, we try not to use any drug in this case, we, we do not use antibiotic prophylaxis in most in instances. In some situations, it could be uh, uh, useful to try when you have a child with uh, uh, repeated infections and you have troubles. Uh, of course, this, you, you should use uh, drugs which have a high excretion with the urine because you need a high concentration at the urinal level, at the bladder level and uh, not to use uh, common drugs that you use to treat uh, uh, phylonephritis. For example, cephalosporins, they give a, a high resistance rate, so it's better not to use cephalosporins in these situations. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I sometimes I'm happy using phosphomycin, uh, which is not a, 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 a real antibiotic. It has got a very low resistance rate. It has been used for more than uh, 45 years now, and still the resistance rate is very, very low. So I try sometimes uh, phosphomycin. But what I would like to underline here is that we should not use antibiotic prophylaxis in most instances. But you showed that this, uh, this may be of advantage in, uh, in the study. Right. So, uh, you showed that it may be of advantage uh, when you have reflux and neurogenic bladder. So, um, but you need a lot of patients to treat. Uh, what do you yeah. think about uh, nitrofurantoin? these patients yeah right? that's another option absolutely 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 that's what we use and then just a question for you is phosphomycin how do you give it because we have some nephrologists here who give it every second or every third day and um, what is the dosage and how often you will give it because it's a I little bit contrary it, uh, what i usually do i give it every other day okay once once at the evening once every other day and in which dosage uh, the... well i have no uh, uh, by heart the the, the 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 dosage now but it, you, I, I use really some rough dosage uh, half of, of, of the top it depends from 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 the weight of the child uh, mm -hmm. i will give i will send you the dosage okay. Okay. Do any comments about that, uh, Rin? No? no. 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 And okay, one comment that maybe could be to to focus also on the bowel management of the constipation of these patients, because uh, it's something that uh, is quite commonly missed, and uh, and we know that uh, if uh, we can reduce the risk of uh, uh, UTI. And uh, what medication are used to treat urinary tract infection caused by resistant bacteria as Klebsiella or Pseudomonas? Well, I discuss every time with my infectivologist what, what I need to use. If I have a multi drug resistant uh, Pseudomonas, uh, uh, I usually use a combination of cephalosporin plus uh, tazobactam or avibactam. Uh, if you have a vancomycin resistant uh, enterococcus, uh, the indication could be daptomycin. Uh, it depends from, from the drug, from, from the bacteria and from what is resistant. The multidrug resistant E. coli could be mesilinum. Uh, it depends also on the availability of these drugs, but I discuss most of the situations with my infectivologist. Any comment by the pediatric urologist? No, I would do the same. Yeah. Okay. I believe that we have other two questions I've seen before. One was about the uh, the uh, the timing of the uh, Renography, if it's correct to perform uh, after three months, uh, or it's better to wait longer. What do you think about that? If if you like to see scars, you have to wait at least three to four months. If you like to see it, if you have a suspicion that there may be a paranephritis or not, and you're not sure, then you can do it immediately. Then you will see that there may be infection of the kidney. But also you can use the ultrasound so you see more or less the same or you have the clinics too so i think when you really like to see scars you have to wait at least three months better i think six months okay general agreement yes, yes. and uh, there is one question about the role of circumcision in boys and uh, will be useful or not to prevent uti There are studies showing this. On, on, on one hand, I think if you have a spina bifida boy with a long prepuce and it's always difficult to retract it, and we think then it may be useful to do a circumcision to facilitate 
just uh, clean or how you make clean intermittent catheterization, not sterile. I think the right term is clean. And so just to do it routinely, I'm very reluctant, but uh, I'm coming from Germany, so I don't know how it's in Italy or in Netherlands. Well, I'm a little bit less reluctant to do circumcision, <clears throat> and especially in very young boys with spinavifida who are on CIC yeah. and have recurrent urinary tract infections, um, then I won't hesitate to offer a circumcision. And there is some evidence that in some categories of patients, it is beneficial. Thanks. But I would, not, I would not do it routinely. Okay, as the last two questions, and one is related to the COVID-19. If there is some experience by you or some evidence about how COVID affects the urinary tract infection in children? Uh, we, we actually have published a, a, a paper of that. Uh, of course, not on spina bifida, but what we've seen is that there was a, a major reduction of uh, UTIs during the COVID period uh, versus the pre-COVID period. Uh, period. Uh, I don't know if this was mainly because people didn't show up to, to the clinics <laughs> because they stayed home finally and they didn't come for every... Uh, that, that's quite difficult to say, but actually we noticed a reduction uh, but I don't believe that COVID per se it's able to reduce UTIs. I mean, mainly it's related to, 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 to the fact that people didn't show up. I have seen in my experience of some cases of severe blood dysfunction uh, as a neurogenic blood after severe COVID infection. Do you have experience with these cases or not? Have you seen? No. 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 Okay, last question is about uh, uh, the uh, surgical uh, treatment, uh, reimplantation, coronary produce a very good resolution or reflux, but adult urologists find uh, as, as subsequent uh, neurological procedures. So uh, if, uh, uh, what is uh, the, your choice between the uh, endurological treatment, the Cohen or Lich Gregoire? I think the argument that you have with the Cohen procedure against endological, endological procedures, I think it's, it's not longer valid because you have uh, flexible endoscopes and yeah. you can do it very easily. So this is not an argument against uh, the Cohen procedure. I think more an argument against the Cohen procedure, maybe if you have a very trabeculated bladder and all these things, that it may be difficult to create a good uh, submucosal tunnel, but this may be more an argument against it. But otherwise, I think this is not an argument against the Cohen procedure. Yeah. And what do you, uh, last uh, uh, comment, what do you think about the role of mini invasive procedure as uh, laparoscopy or robotic for reimplantation, extravesical reimplantation in this kind of a bladder, in aerogenic bladder? Could be useful or not? I have no experience with that. So yeah. I think when you come to the decision to do this, uh, additionally to the augmentation of the bladder, a reimplantation of the bladder, I think to do it with a robot or to take with laparoscopically, it's very demanding. So I think it's much easier to do it open in these cases because usually you have a very wall bladder and it things, and then it makes it extremely difficult. Okay. Thank you very much for your participation and uh, uh, very, I believe that was very, very interesting. This is my opinion and I hope all, all the audience enjoyed it. And thank you very much uh, again. And uh, uh, the next webinar will be with uh, Professor Rafal Sharzan by Krakow University, Gaylonian University. And, uh, the, uh, and the, of course, uh, thanks Darren to remember to us, uh, everyone who attends the live webinar will receive a certificate of attendance. One hour after the scheduled finish time, 
you will also receive a survey to complete. Please complete it and all suggestions are welcome. And also we shall see this format in uh, Excel format of the following days. And uh, uh, if you complete the survey, you will receive a CMI credits. And uh, thanks again. And uh, uh, Dr. Zimak, please. I want to say to thank uh, our outstanding speakers, Professor Stein, Professor Mantini, Professor Musiello, and Professor Rian Nyman, um, and uh, of course uh, Darren Shehan for organizational and technical support, and all our participants. Uh, we have uh, we have we had very interesting discussion. Я від імені нашої аудиторії дякую нашим шановним сьогоднішнім спікерам та панелістам і за цікаву дискусію, яку ми зможемо переглянути також на сайті у запису. Також можна додати свої питання при бажанні і у письмовому вигляді. Нагадуємо про це і запрошуємо на наступний вебінар, який відбудеться 7 березня і разом із професором Рафалом Шаном обговорюватимемо питання лікування першої лінії, чиста періодична катетеризація і застосування антихолінергічних засобів. Дякую всім за цікаву зустріч. До наступних зустрічей. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much again. Thanks, Darren, for your support. And thanks to the all organizer and Omninet, International Federation of Spina Bifida, Eurogen, and Ercanet. And thanks again to all the speaker, Professor Montini, Professor Stein, and thanks to support Professor Nyman. See you the next webinar, the 7th of March. Thank you again.